Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, for a while, I've had people ask about teaching burns. It's not something um, I've taught in the past, but as I've gotten into my new role working in trauma, I have gotten a little bit more, not too much experience, but I should say a little more knowledge around it. And um, I utilized a nursing textbook just to kind of get some information. So I'm going to do my best with this. Hopefully it's the what you're looking for and should give you a fairly comprehensive view about burns. Um, I did include some pictures of burns in here. I tried to, there's, they can get pretty gross. And so um, I didn't get too, too crazy with the pictures, um, but you can Google those, but they're all like, you know, watch out. This image is super scary. So just know if you have a weak stomach, um, not on this video, but if you look up burns, um, you, you might have some trouble. So um, anyway, let's talk about burns. So there's different types of burns. There's what's known as thermal burns. Um, so thermal burns come from like hot metals, liquids, steam, flames are probably the most common. This is what we think of when we think of a burn. There's also chemical burns. So like when there's acidic chemicals or other dangerous chemicals, sometimes people work in places where they're dealing with these chemicals, um, it can uh, cause a burn. And then there's also electrical burns. So from wires, power lines, or other live electrical sources, you can also get an electrical burn. So um, burns not only have types, um, like of what the, I should say sources, they also have classifications. Um, we can classify it based on its depth, the extent, the location, but usually we do it by depth. And when I say depth, I say, how, I'm talking about how deep into the, what layer of the skin tissue are we getting all the way in the muscle, we on the superficial layers. And so usually they um, categorize them into either partial thickness, which is first and second degree burns. They're either superficial or deep or full thickness is third and fourth degree burns. So we're gonna break down each um, classification here. First, there's a first degree burn. This is an example. So um, it's usually from a quick exposure to some really intense um, uh, heat, or it can also be like a sunburn. Uh, and so what you're going to notice on the skin is it looks red. It's blanchable, which means blanchable means when you push down and let go, that it returns to the color it's supposed to be. So let's say if I had some, they, they, we always talk about like non blanchable redness. If I had some redness on my hand here and I pushed on it um, and then let go, if it didn't change colors, then um, and go back to um, uh, what it was like change colors and that, that's usually a sign that it's not blanchable. So it's all about the color change. Um, uh, the skin is also usually going to be painful. They might have mild swelling, but a big important thing to note is with first degree, there is no blisters. That's going to really help you to differentiate the first and the second degree because in a second degree, and these are probably the most intense pictures I have in the entire thing. So just keep in mind. So these are more like second degree burns where you can see there's blisters present here. Um, it's red, shiny, wet. Um, they're usually having more severe pain and mild to moderate edema. This can happen from chemicals, electrical current, flames, scald, tar cement. Don't look so much at the causes with these because like the cause, it can really vary for all of them. Think more, what is the skin going to look like? How deep are we going? So for third and fourth degree burns, I kind of... Um, uh, I'm just showing you the, the difference here. You know, we have first degree, there's no blisters, but redness and some mild swelling. Second degree, we have blisters, more swelling, more pain. Now here we're getting down to third degree burns. You can see we're getting deep into, um, deeper into the tissue. Um, again, don't worry too much about the causes. They're very, generally the same. But with these, compared to the last one, these are more dry. Remember the second degree are more wet. Um, and that's about which layer of tissue of skin that we're in. Um, they can be kind of waxy or leathery, the skin brown or charred. And it's, we're actually getting down into the nerves here where sometimes nerves are burned off where we can have insensitivity to pain. You may also notice that there are muscles, tendon, or bone that you can see because that's how deep we're going. Now, you can see I put third and fourth degree together because, um, I mean, really, the I think the big thing, I think I have it on the next slide, it goes down to what we can see, like how deep we are. But um, these are fairly similar when it comes to what they look like. 
Um, but to compare when we're getting, um, if we're in the muscle and the bone, we're fourth degree. If you just, if you don't see any muscle or bone, but we're deep into that past the, um, and we have that more dry appearance, we're most likely a third degree. Now, some of these, like, again, this is a practitioner, like I'm never going to look at a burn and have to stage a burn. Um, I can look and have a general idea of how deep I am, uh, how deep it is, or like how serious that at the burn is, but I'm not going to be the one grading it. So I would hope that, um, you know, um, in a nursing school exam, they would maybe just give you like general symptoms and like very much easier things like telling the difference between a third and a fourth degree burn is a little bit deeper. But again, it just goes down to can you see muscle or bone, muscle or bone, it's fourth degree, um, just deep, but just skin layers of the skin, more of a dry appearance, third degree, second degree blisters, moist, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, and then first degree, it's going to be that, uh, what do you call it? Just surface layer redness and, uh, some swelling. So other ways that we talk about burns is we measure burns. And so this is something that's really important because it tells us how severe the burn is. Um, we also use it to determine what type of care they need. So like at my facility, I don't work at a burn facility. So if we have someone come in with more than 20% of their body burned, then we are going to send them to a nearby facility that has more capacity to treat their burns. Um, but if we we are you know able to treat more minor burns, um, but we want to make sure that the person's in a facility that can care for them um, throughout their course of their burn. So we're looking, sorry, my cat's me this morning, the percentage of their body area burned. Um, it also tells us how much fluid they need because depending on that, sorry, I'm trying to figure out where she is, depending on where, um, uh, what do you call it, depending on how much percentage that they're burned, um, they may need more fluids. Um, but yeah, it kind of tells us about severity. So we use this, what's called the rule of nines. And it's called the rule of nines because at least for adults, everything is in like there's 9%, half of 9% is 4.5, double 9% is 18. So if you can kind of remember that, you know, for children, it gets a little different where it's mostly that, but there is sevens in the legs. And then when we get down here, we're also um, a little bit different. I did come up with this little thing. I don't know if it'll be helpful, um, but um uh, trying to make it simple for adults, the torso is 18, legs are larger than arms, so they're nine, where arms are half a leg, 4.5, and if you've got a good head on your shoulder, so think your shoulders are attached to your arms, so they're also going to be, um, your head is going to be 4.5, and that the perineum isn't as pertinent um, if you like alliteration, it is 1%. So um, sometimes you just have to, this might be something to kind of um, study on a note card, something like that, if you're struggling with it. Um, but this is a common question is like, hey, here's where they're burned. Um, what percentage is it? Um, then for pediatrics and infants, um, children, they only change in the lower extremities and head. So they have a better head on their shoulders. Remember adults are 4.5, they are 9%. So um, upper body is all the same. So the arms and the um, torso is the same and legs are less. So instead of nine, they are 7%. Um, and then for infants, everything doubles, but the torso and the perineum stays the same. So they have a big old head. They're a double child. So they are 18 for their head arms of steel. So they're up to 9%. They kind of have the, so they have the, what adults have for legs on their arms. So nine, uh, 9%, it's also double, um, uh, what, um, uh, children have for their arms and then thick thighs save lies. So they have 14%. So, yeah, so it's really, if you double, if you can remember what the children have, just doubling that might help except for the torso and the perineum. So these are just some, um, little funny things. If it helps you to remember it, uh, I hope it's useful. <laughs> My mind is a special place. So where are we focused with burns? <laughs> Excuse me. This is a lot. That was a lot of information, just general, like, hey, what is um, uh, like basic information when it comes to classifying burns? But as the nurse, again, like I'm also not the one in real life to um, figure out the percentage. Like I can look and have a general idea. Hey, this is, um, you know, they're really um, highly burned, et cetera. But it's actually not my job to um uh, calculate the percentage either. And so maybe if you work in a burn center, that might be something that's on the nurses, but I will guarantee you 99.9% .9 
It's a physician or provider thing. So what am I going to be doing as the nurse? So there's a lot of ways that burns affect our, our mind, body, soul. Um, we're going to fo focus on a few different ones. I'm going to break these down. Um, my goodness, child. So yeah, sorry, my cat. Hold on one second. I'm going to try to let her out so that maybe she'll be quiet. All right, so getting back to what we were talking about. So some things I'm worried about, like the top thing that I'm worried about, especially when these patients acutely come in is their airway and their breathing. And we'll talk about why um, here in a minute because that is a big thing, but there's lots of ways that burns compromise airway and breathing. Um, we're always also worried about the loss of circ, my goodness gracious, um, worried about the loss of circulation. Um, especially if they have circumferential burns. We'll talk about that too. Um, it's very painful. Burns really hurt, especially depending um, depending on the depth of them, but the care that's required for them, it is super painful. So pain management is a big priority. Um, fluid shifts, so they can have some instability, some circulation issues when we're talking about um, burns lead to what's called third spacing. And um, we'll talk more in depth about fluid replacement and needs of a patient because they can become very unstable pretty quick. Um, they also need a lot of nutrition for healing. You know, burns are like a wound and they need a thorough wound care. And in order for the skin to heal, you need lots and lots and lots of vitamins and minerals, and nutrients. And then um, burns are a long recovery and they require a lot of specialized care. Um, so um, like I mentioned before, even some of the top hospitals might not be burn certified or have burn centers, um, burn ICUs and things like that. So um, it definitely can, uh, it requires a lot of TLC. So let's talk about airway and breathing um, problems. So um, damage can happen to the airway and the breathing structures because people are inhaling hot air. So it can directly, the hot air itself can cause burns internally. Um, also from inhaling noxious chemicals like the acidic chemicals can damage it that way. And then also direct burns to the airway itself. So people have facial burns, um, oral burns, burns to the neck, burns to the chest. It creates pressure because um, burns become very thick, inflamed, um, there's a lot of um, fluid shifts and stuff like that, but it creates a heaviness. So even if I have a burn on my chest, it can create pressure and it can lead for it to be hard to expand um, my lungs. So um, the things you want to look for either in their story or in their assessment that are going to tell you that there's an issue Um so if in their story, they say they were in an enclosed space, um, you should assume that they have some sort of inhalation injury. That should be like a ding, ding, ding. If they said like, yeah, we were in an enclosed room when the fire happens or something like that, um, you should be worried because then they're in a closed space um, inhaling that smoke, um, that hot air. It can definitely create a inhalation injury pretty quickly. Um, it can also cause... Um, uh, there can be carbon monoxide poisoning and things like that as well. Um, you want to look for changes in mental status. It can be a sign of poor perfusion, oxygenation. Uh, the, the cherry red skin color, like this is one of those nursing school things that we talk about a lot. And it seems like a hallmark sign in real life. I've heard um, that it doesn't happen as often as what we talk about in the textbooks. But um, this a cherry red skin color is a sign that you're... Um, uh, I'm not going to say that long word, but like carbon monoxide levels are getting greater than 20%. Um, and so um, again, it doesn't happen in every single patient, but it is a possible sign. The patient's coughing often, um, showing signs of decreased oxygen saturations. Then you want to listen for the quality of their ability to talk. If their voice is very hoarse, if you hear strider, those are signs of airway obstruction or impending airway obstruction. Um, and then rapid shallow breathing um, can also be another issue. And, um, uh, you know, because tachypnea is some, uh, one of your body's first mechanisms or breathing fast is one of your first mechanisms sometimes to, re to compensate when you're not doing well. And then any sort of singed nasal, uh, nasal or facial hair um, should kind of tell you maybe there's an issue here. So what do we do about it? So we want to give them humidified, 100% oxygen. Um, we intubate these patients early. So we stick breathing tubes in them early because we don't want to wait till late when there's a real problem um, and uh, 
to like pretty much wait till um, I want to say this, uh, I was gonna say bad words, but I'm gonna try to be better till the crap hits the fan. Um, <laughs> and so um, uh, we don't want to wait till then to uh, intubate them because what happens is like I said, there's a, there's a big inflammatory or swelling process. So maybe I just have a minor injury to my airway, but after a few days, swelling and swelling, it can get to the point where we can't even get a breathing tube in this patient. So before we get to that point, we want to protect their airway get what's called a definitive airway or um, you know a temporary airway until the swelling goes down um, we want to also obtain an abg um, the carby this is that long word i'll say har carboxyhemoglobin levels um, chest x-ray to see how they're doing because we're checking to see if they're oxygenating but also if they have that carbon monoxide um, poisoning and um, seeing what's going on inside their lungs. Uh, then we wanna place them in a high Fowler's position. That's gonna help with any swelling, but it's also gonna help them with better lung expansion. We're gonna do SpO2 monitoring, of course, and then SBCO monitoring, which is the carbon monoxide monitoring if it's available. And so, um, the next problem that we can have is fluid and volume problems. So I talked about third spacing. So during the inflammatory process, what happens in inflammation is the body senses that it needs to defend itself. It needs to do something, protect itself. So usually its doors are closed, but what it does is it lets, it opens its doors a little bit to allow um, the fighter guys to come in and fight whatever's going on. But when it leaves its doors open like this, certain stuff can slip through and some of that certain stuff is fluid. So fluid starts going where it's not supposed to go and fluid shifts to the tissue. So it ends up, this patient gets really, really swollen in edematous. Um, we're also going to be worried about kidney perfusion and kidney injury because the kidneys are very fluid, selfish and fluid dependent. And so um, we really want to watch the kidney function closely and we want to make sure that they are not um, having too many issues when it comes to uh, like that they're getting enough fluid to their kidneys. Um, usually these patients need massive fluid resuscitation. So they're going to need like a lot of IV fluids. Like um, we get, we, we, um, we give these patients a lot. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. Um, and so as a result of that, we really need good intravenous access as well. Um, so we need to make sure that we have good IV access because especially too, let's say that they have burns on their extremities, um, swelling happens and other stuff. It can be really hard to get good access on these people, especially if they have like widespread burns. Um, we usually do two large bore IVs or get central access. There's a formula we're going to talk about to calculate appropriate fluid resuscitation. And then we're going to mo monitor their vitals, their urine output and everything for improvement. So the other hard thing that students struggle with is these formulas for fluid resuscitation. Um, the, these formulas for fluid resuscitation usually only apply to those that have greater than a 20% total body surface area burned. So remember we said that's why that number is so important because we need to know how much is burned so we know what kind of fluid replacement they need. A lot of others can do oral replacement if it's safe, um, just depending on where their burns are, if they can swallow, et cetera. Um, pretty much all patients that have burns are going to get some sort of fluids, but we just, we, um, we are super heavy with those that have um, these greater than 20% burns. So I looked on the American Burn Association and I looked up the Parkland formula because those are both very commonly used. And I've noticed that there's a, a little bit of a variance. Um, sometimes like I know at my hospital, we do like, we've done like the modified Parklands, which is two mils instead of four, but most of these formulas have, we give four milliliters of lactated ringers. We multiply that by their weight in kilograms and multiply that by their percentage of their body that's burned. And this is not just like their rate an hour. This is how much they're gonna get over the next 24 hours, but they're, we're gonna half it. The first half should be given in the first eight hours and the second half we put over 16 hours. So you can see there's lots of math here, which is why I'm glad I've never had to teach this. <laughs> so um, it's definitely, um, it's definitely some work, but I think doing some practice problems and stuff around this could help you. Maybe I'll in the future work on something along those lines.
Um, we also, uh, we know that fluid resuscitation is, success is successful um, if they're showing signs of good perfusion to their organs. So we're going to look at end organ perfusion, body perfusion. And so we look at that mostly through urine output. For adults, we're going to expect that 0 0.5 to 1 mil per cake per hour. And for children, it'll be 1 to 1.5 milliliters per cake per hour. Um, we can also look at their cardiac status. Is their MAP greater than 65? That's showing they're getting good in organ perfusion. Is their systolic above 90? Heart rate less than 20? Like these are all things showing that they're um, getting better hydration. It, numbers are not perfect. We have to look at the whole clinical picture, but these numbers can be helpful. Um, so aside from issues with fluid because of those fluid shifts, we can also have loss of circulation or perfusion to extremities. So this is more talking about loss of circulation to extremities um, due to what's called circumferential burns. And circumferential burns are ones that are all the way around. So if on my arm, I had a burn that went all the way around my arm, it can actually start to constrict on those blood vessels, almost think like a compartment syndrome um, where it, um, uh, it creates pretty much um, inability to get flow to my extremity. And so um, they may need what's called an escarterotomy. This is a lot like a fasciotomy where we cut in and leave um, space so that um, there's actually ability for blood to flow. Um, it's not necessarily something that's happening right away. Um, it can actually happen later because um, that edema sometimes takes a few days to really set in. So you really need to keep a close eye on your extremities, doing good neurovascular assessments um, and watching for that. Um, also, you want to consider how burns may limit chest expansion. So you really want to get a accurate, not just saying 18, but count the respiratory rate and look at the chest wall movement. Because um, if their chest isn't expanding well, they're also going to be at risk for lung injuries and um, issues with ventilation. These patients are also high risk for blood clots. So um, we'll talk more about that, but we usually have to keep a close eye on their um, status with that. These patients need thorough wound care. So we usually do, um, once they get stable, um, we do daily showers with them, thorough debriding and wound care. The patient can be shivering. I know that's going to sound counterintuitive, but they commonly shiver. So we want to keep them warm. I know you're going to think warm, but they were burnt but um, we definitely want to prevent them because that increases their metabolism and makes their body work harder. Um, if not already done, protect against tetanus. We want to observe for any signs of infection because we literally, remember, the skin is the organ that is there to help protect you from outside issues, outside things. So we really need to observe closely for infection because we're taking, like, when they have a burn, we're taking away their defense against um, organisms. So organisms can get in. So we have to protect these patients. We wear a lot of PPE. We keep them um, very safe from infection. Um, we pre-medicate them with pain medicine before any um, wound care, and we make sure to wear appropriate PPE, like I mentioned. Um, we do a variety of treatments, dressings, and care when it comes to wounds. It's going to vary. I'm not going to go deep into that. It depends on if they have grafts or no grafts, the depth of the wound, um, but um, there's a very deep wound care. It's a whole specialty. Um, then also we want to elevate because elevation helps to reduce that edema that they have. Um, like I mentioned, nutritional needs. Um, after a burn, you pretty much go into this hypermetabolic state. Um, they start breaking down protein and um, you have increased gluconeogenesis. Um, so if you don't feed them to match this, um, they can have malnutrition, delayed healing. So we want to start feeding them early. Now, sometimes we're going to need that enteral parenteral nutrition, depending on where their burns are, if they're intubated, et cetera. But we want to collaborate with the dietitian and just consider that they might need a lot of supplements, nutrients, vitamins um, to help support them. Last but not least, just a couple other considerations. Um, we need to monitor their electrolytes closely, especially their sodium and potassium. It can either be low or high, depending on what's going on with them. So watch those closely, keep them on EKG monitor. Um, remember skin is your first line of defense, like I mentioned, watch for infection. We wanna get them up and moving as tolerated. Um, they can have a lot of complications of immobility. So we want to be watching them closely for that. Um, the blood glucose can be increased for a variety of reasons. So watch that to make sure that they're not going to have complications. Because remember, if your blood sugar is high, you can't heal as well. And it also can affect blood vessels, blood flow. Um, and there can be a lot of complications. Like we do not want a high blood glucose in someone that we is really sick that we're trying to get to, um, to heal and to be better. Um, 
can, like we talked about, considering their tetanus immunization status, um, watch their neurological status closely. There's a lot of um, possible things that can go long, wrong with their neurological status. It could be a sign of an oxygen issue. could be a sign of a low sodium issue. Um, it could be a sign of um, uh, other issues, depending on where the burns and stuff are. So just keep a close eye on their neurological status. And then their psychosocial needs. And this could be like a whole PowerPoint by itself. But this patient was maybe in a traumatic event. This patient has to have daily um, incredibly painful, traumatizing wound care. Um, be kind, um, consider what they're going through, talk to them, let them express themselves. They may have to scream and cry throughout their wound care, but um, let them feel what they're feeling and express themselves, be supportive, therapeutic communication, and um, uh, trying to uh, support them the best that you can in a difficult situation. Know that this is a long-term thing, so there's going to be ups and downs. We're going to have good days and bad days. I think those are the big pictures of what I want to share. Hopefully this is what you guys were looking for when it comes to this. This is probably the best that I could do, but um, yeah, if there's additional things that you need, let me know if I can help. See you for the next one.